Come on, come on over there. Well, welcome this morning, uh, our Sunday school class. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning on, on this Lord's Day. And uh, as, as we know, Pastor Scott has started his sabbatical. I think he leaves this morning. Um, but uh, in his absence, we're going to have a number of different men filling the pulpit and a number of different guys teaching us during Sunday school. I think everyone here knows Model, so we welcome him this morning to teach us during Bible class. So welcome, brother. Thank you. Good morning, all. Glad to see you. You know, ideally, in, in Bible class, it's that last word that we want to fulfill, the word class. So I'm not here to, to, uh, to pontificate or to entertain, but I really want to open the floor this morning, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to hope for a back-and-forth dialogue because the section of Scripture that I'd like to look at this morning has a lot to teach us if we stop and, and put on our Bible school hats for a moment. Uh, many, many years ago, I walked into Northeastern Bible College, which you know, used to be in Essex Fells and eventually got uh, swallowed by the King's College, still, still there. And uh, here's what I heard on the first day of Bible College, good old Northeastern, in Classroom 101, which was the biggest classroom of them all. And they said this, context is king. Context is king. A verse taken out of its context often becomes a pretext for anything the speaker wants it to be. So that drives us back to the question of asking about the context. So let's open our Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible with you, some of the people now have it on phones. Um, I'm no longer offended when I see people looking at their phones during my message because I actually was at a conference overseas several weeks ago, and I needed every ounce was important. And so I needed to have something compact, so I had a tiny print Bible, and I, I barely was able to see it. But on my phone, I now have joined, I'm kind of up to 2015 now in technology. So in Luke chapter 4, there is a very interesting passage that may be well known to you who are uh, good Bible students, but I'd like us to stop and consider the context. And that's what we're going to do, and we're going to pause for questions, and hopefully you'll have a few answers as I ask questions, and maybe vice versa. Context is everything. It is possible to approach the New Testament Scriptures with blinders on. You know, the reason they put blinders on racehorses is they don't want to see, they don't want the racehorse looking to the left or right and getting distracted. The goal is, is always in front of them. And that's appropriate if you're in the Kentucky Derby. But for us, opening up God's Word, it's really not appropriate. We need to see what's going on around us. And the reason for that is if you don't understand or you willfully ignore the context, you're then not getting the proper interpretation of what the verse means. There's an old, I'm going to reveal a little bit about my age, there are old skits. I don't, remember the, I don't know if you remember the, the honeymooners. There were a number of skits where Ralph would come to the door and he'd listen and there was his wife and some other voice that he didn't recognize. And the two ladies were talking about something that seemed very suspicious. And as he's listening, he's getting more agitated. He's thinking, oh, she's being unfaithful. And he barges in. And they both have scripts in front of them, and they're rehearsing a play. That's an old sort of gag, and that, that was commonly used. But that's the type of thing that happens when we go to especially a narrative passage of Scripture, and we ignore the context. I understand it's very tempting to want to go into the Bible and extract those little nuggets that are very tasty and, and very delicious and, and feed our souls and remind us of the nature and character of God. 
And that's all fine and good. But sometimes you wind up taking a verse so far out of context that your understanding of it, your interpretation, your application of it, actually winds up being entirely different from the way the passage is used in Scripture. Probably um, in Luke chapter 4, we will have a passage that a number of you have read. Uh, it's a passage that is, is common, so I'm going to turn there. And in Luke chapter 4, there is a situation where Jesus is just beginning his public ministry. Okay, so Messiah Jesus is at the beginning of his public ministry. He begins his public ministry in chapter 4 with those days in the desert where Jesus goes off into the desert by himself in preparation and strengthening. You know, he was fully God. We, we affirm that. But at the same time, he was God enveloped in a human frame. So the human part of who he was felt hunger, felt temptation. That's why scripture says he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. In other words, he didn't float above our problems. He plunged into the mass of, of human endeavor. He was fully involved in all human activity. He grew up as the oldest child in a family where there were at least five or six kids. His four or five brothers are named, at least two sisters. So you have a busy household of at least seven or eight children. He's the oldest. He's a, you're the responsible one, Yeshua. You should be, you know, <laughs> this is what he heard. He saw the misbehavior of his siblings. He saw the misbehavior of the, the people around him. So it wasn't as though he comes to our experience in, without a knowledge of what we go through. And so in chapter 4, he is in the desert. He is fasting and praying. He's filling himself up with God's word. By the way, he is the word of God, but there is this unknowable combination of God and man something that theologians will never be able to adequately explain with human words. That's why I'm always amused when theologians imagine they can get everything so exactly correct in these systematic theologies. Listen, I've got a shelf full of systematic theologies. They have their place. But they all ultimately fail to picture the unknowable God. And that's what we see when we come to chapter 4. Jesus is in the desert he is strengthening the human part of him. And then he, of course, he's tempted by the devil. We all understand that in each instance where Messiah was tempted by Satan, he answers with the word of God. He answers with actually the, with the, from the Torah. It is very appropriate that this Jewish Messiah responds to Hasatan and his temptations with a verse from Torah each time. Torah would be the the five books of Moses, and he responds in that way. So now we come to the portion I'd really like us to just toss around this morning. Verse 14, Jesus returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit. By the way, the Galilee is still called the Galilee. If you go on a tour to Israel, that's what they still call it. So he returned to the Galilee where he had been brought up. That's where Nazareth is. It is in the Galilee. He returned in the fullness of the Spirit, and news about him was spreading through all of the surrounding district. In other words, he, people always knew that he was, there was something somehow different about him. He was always the responsible one. He was always uh, the individual who uh, represented the family well. And, and by the way, at this point in time, as we'll learn just three years later, it does seem that Joseph is out of the picture. Most likely he had passed away already by this point. And the other young men, his, the half-brothers of Jesus, would have stepped forward to take some responsibility for the family. And yet Yeshua was always the one who was there, able to quote God's word, able to represent the family. So news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues 
and was praised by all. Pause for a moment. There, Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 4, verse 15. He began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Friends, I understand that it is difficult for most of us to separate our cultural context of belief from what happened 2,000 years ago. So here we are, we're on a Sunday morning, it's Sunday morning in America, in church buildings across this country. Congregations are meeting or preparing to meet. Uh, I just got a phone call as I was preparing to leave this morning. Um, I'm here, but I'm actually directing the program of the Ariel Bible School in upstate New York, which is an eight-week Bible course, eight-week school, and I'm in charge of some aspects of it, but I can't get there until about eight, nine days from now. So I have a deputy in charge, and he gave me a phone call this morning to report that everything is in place for the Sunday morning service. Uh, he and his wife are doing music. Our guest speaker, a physician, is in place. And so they're meeting there in a, in a cabin up in the middle of the Adirondacks. And we're meeting here, and there are people meeting in larger and smaller buildings. And that is our context of what we think of when we think about believing in Jesus. Sunday morning, Christianity in America. But understand that in Luke chapter 4, we have the Christ, the Christ. And what was his common pattern? Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Let me ask for some responses here. When you say, think of the word Sabbath, what day comes to mind? Just honestly, if, ignore the fact that I'm here and I've got this beard and I'm Jewish. When you, when you typically growing up in whatever evangelical, what, what did you think of? Someone. Sunday. Yeah. Most people who are followers of Jesus the Messiah, when they hear the word Sabbath, Think of Sunday. What title have you ever heard Sunday called by? Lord's the Lord's Day. Anything else? Day of, Day of rest. Thank you. Do you ever hear anyone call it the Christian Sabbath? That the Lord's Day was changed from Saturday to Sunday? These are all concepts that go around. Now, I'm not here to disrespect any of that, but let me make a simple suggestion. God rested on the seventh day. You know, some calendars, if they're traditionals, are set up with Sunday in the, the left-hand column. The first column is Sunday. It's the first day of the week, and it progresses all the way to Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. The Lord saw all that he had done in creation, and on the seventh day he rested. He ceased. He had a sabbatical. Uh, he rested and he ceased. Not that he needed to physically rest, but it's a way for us to understand what happened. And so Sunday has always been the first day of the week. Saturday has always been the seventh day of the week. It's been always been the Sabbath. The Sabbath as a regulation is different from understanding the Sabbath as simply something that we see in creation. Not until Mosaic law Again, not until Mosaic law was given by the God of Israel to the people of Israel, not until then was Sabbath commanded as something that people needed to follow. Now, the Sabbath had always been Saturday, but it wasn't a command as far as a set of rules and obligations of do's and don'ts until you see it come forward in the Torah, in the books of Numbers, um, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, in those four books of the Bible. That's when it becomes a rule. But here, Jesus is in the context of his day. Think about the town of Nazareth. Has anyone ever been to Nazareth? You've been on a church tour of the Holy Land. You've been to Nazareth? Anyone? I was in, I was in Israel. I spent a month in Israel in 2018. 
And I walked up and down the streets of Nazareth. It's a very hilly city. It's very, it's always hills in one direction or the other. Um, 2,000 years ago when this was written, Nazareth was largely Jewish. It was almost predominantly Jewish. The synagogue there in Nazareth mentioned in verse 16 probably wasn't the only one. There were probably others as well. In fact, if you go back to verse 15, news about him was spreading in the district. Where was it spreading? In the synagogues, because he was going around teaching. So verse 15, he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And so again, context is important. Sunday at this point is just the first day of the week. If you go to Israel today and you ask them, what are the days of the week? They would tell you Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, the first day, the second day. They actually call the days of the week, not by the Roman gods that we have adopted, Thor's day, Wednesday. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that because those have completely lost their pagan associations. We don't use, when we say Thor's day, we don't think of Thor. <laughs> okay, we just, it's Thursday. I've got to get the laundry done because it's Thursday. Uh, that's all we think of. So don't let anyone put a guilt trip on you. Oh, why do you call it Thor's Day when you're referring to a Roman god? By the way, that same logic goes to Christmas as well. This is why I reject all those silly ideas that, oh, we can't celebrate Christmas because it has this pagan origin or this thing. No, these, these things are completely separate from what Christmas is to believers today. We celebrate it, and rightly so, as a celebration of the birth of our Savior. And that's a good thing to do. So don't let anyone pull what is called an anachronistic sort of reasoning, where they pull something that used to be true 2,000 years ago and say, well, that's what it was 2,000 years ago. So that's why you can't do it today. 60 years ago, we could have used the word, hey, I feel gay today. There, there were songs, the, the music men, they're marching and saying, you know, it's wonderful to be gay and happy. Well, that, <laughs> we, can't, we can't say that anymore because the word has totally changed in its meaning. And so those words are important. And here in Luke chapter 4, what we see is we see Jesus going to a place on Saturday. It's Saturday morning. What do you think they might have done in a typical synagogue service? I would really be curious to hear this. What composed, what, what, what comprised a typical synagogue service? Anyone? Reading of, the Old Testament. Reading of the Old Testament, which at that point was the only testament, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. You take out the scroll, the ark, mm -hmm. the ark, it's a big deal. Yes, very Verna is cheating because she's Jewish. <laughs> we understand both Verna and I and a number of others have seen that on a Saturday morning, to combine what Jeff said about the reading of God's word, the reading of God's word is done in a very formal, ornate ceremony where they'll take out the Torah scroll from the ark in the front of the synagogue, and it's spread on a very large table, and people stand when the when the word is read. And actually, that ceremony brings us right to this passage. Because if you look at verse 16, again, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. So number one, it was his hometown synagogue. Very possibly, let me suggest to you, his half-brothers and half-sisters might have actually been sitting in the audience or in the, the assembled benches or however they would have arranged it. We don't know if there were separate seating at that point. In Orthodox synagogues today, there are separate seating. There's men on one side, women on the other, or women toward the rear, behind a curtain. There's all kinds of customs. And so very likely, there were members of Jesus' earthly family, his half-brothers, half-sisters, there in the audience. He had been brought up in Nazareth, as was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. So it was his custom to be in the hearing of God's word 
each and every Sabbath. Now, it is perfectly appropriate for us to take that principle and make a valid application of that to a church setting today on Sunday. We're not saying the church on Sunday is the same as the synagogue in verse 16. We don't want to make that mistake because that's a mistake that some people and some, even some evangelical circles, they make. Now, I, for one, this is just my view. It may not be the view of not everyone, but it's my understanding that the church, the New Testament church, started at Pentecost. The Old Testament congregation is a different entity. God has a plan and program for Israel. No one gets into the kingdom of God, by the way, without personal individual faith. Sometimes when I talk about God's eternal plan for the people of Israel, people get nervous because they talk about the fact, well, everyone has sinned. No one gets into the kingdom of God. No one is approved without accepting Jesus as Savior. Amen to that. That's absolutely true. But there is coming a time when Scripture prophesies that the Jewish people will look upon him, the pierced one, recognize that he is the Messiah, and call upon his name. It's clearly laid out in Zechariah chapter 10 through chapter 14. So there is coming that day. But when you see the pattern here in verse 16, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he engaged with God's word. That's the reason, by the way, that you're meeting on Sunday. You're following the same pattern that Jesus established. But you see, you're following it in the thing that he did establish, which is the New Testament church. Jesus said when he was on earth, I will build my church. It was something that was yet future. And on the day of Pentecost, in that upper room, Acts chapter 2, the church was born. It is the body of those who are believers in Jesus the Messiah. And so as you continue on there in verse 16, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. Again, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever the weather was, whatever was on TV, Messiah was in the synagogue on Sabbath. So it says that he stood up to read. By the way, everyone stood up. When you have a Torah service in a synagogue and you bring out the scroll before they open up the ark and draw away the curtains, they will, if, if people aren't already standing, they will say, congregation, please rise. They will actually request that the congregation rises. And then they'll very carefully remove the Torah scroll or scrolls from the ark, from this wooden chest, this large, it's about eight feet high, and everyone is standing out of reverence for God's word because here is a handwritten scroll. The Torah, the five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the way it's presented physically is on a parchment, it's an animal skin scroll. Animal skin, usually goat skin, sheep skin, that has been stretched very smooth, sanded down, cut into rectangles, and then sewn edge to edge to make a very long scroll that is approximately, in feet, it's maybe about 110 feet long. It's that long, and that's a small one. Uh, and so they have this Torah scroll. There is some aspect of it that maybe it's almost like ob- worship of an object. We don't want to worship objects. God's word is eternal. It can't be contained in a printed book. It either can, it can be contained in a Torah scroll with handwritten with a quill pen on, on parchment. It is the word of God, but the word of God is eternal. And so Messiah stands up to read. Everyone else is reading. Now, typically what they did in the Torah service at that time is they read a portion of God's word from the five books of Moses. In fact, if you would go on any website right now and say, what is the Torah portion of the week? You would find that synagogues typically will post what Torah portion they're reading that week. Every week they read the same portion. And so it can be uh, 
berachato, uh, it might be lechlecha, um, it might be a number of other portions. Uh, and so they are all reading the same Torah portion, which typically are about four chapters of the books of Moses. But then, and here's what we're going to see in this passage, there is an accompanying, a matching reading from the prophets. And that reading is called the Haftarah reading. Sometimes pronounced Haftorah, but it's really Haftarah. What that means is they look at the Torah portion for that week, the liturgical portion, they look at its theme, and then they try to find a matching theme in the Torah, in, in the prophets. So if the Torah portion is talking about mercy, they'll try to find a portion in the prophets that talks about mercy, and there are many of those. Now, in this instance, notice verse 17. It says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Okay? Now, what, what it seems to be is, in verse 16, he's reading the Torah portion because he stood up to read. We don't know if this is the same thing as verse 17. One way or another, it wouldn't actually matter because in verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Each of the prophets was written on a separate, large parchment scroll. And Jesus opened the scroll and found the place where it is written. And now he's about to read the Haftarah portion. He's about to read the portion from the prophets that accompanies the Torah portion. This is what he reads. The spirit of Jehovah is upon me because he has anointed me. Do you know that the word anoint in the original Hebrew is the word Mashiach? It's the word Messiah. Literally what that verse says, because he has messiahed me, using it as a verb. He has made me Messiah to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are downtrodden and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. One of the things you want to do when every the New Testament says he, he read from the Old Testament is let's find the portion where he read from. Maybe there's another clue, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn back to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61 is where he was reading from, and let's see if there is anything unusual about the way that he read and particularly about where he stopped. Okay, so Jesus starts to read the portion. It's Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. He's reading from a scroll. And his last words are, I've come to set free those who are downtrodden and to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. Now let's look at the original to see if Jesus quoted this scripture accurately. Chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Now here's verse 2 in your Bible, Isaiah 61, verse 2. And to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. Wait a second. What's the next phrase? and the day of vengeance of our God. That's the very next phrase that is in the same verse. Turn back to Luke chapter 4. Wait a second, Jesus didn't say that. Why did Jesus stop in the middle of verse 2? Why did Jesus stop in the middle of verse 2? Well, look back at the Isaiah 61 text. In the first few verses, there, these are the things that Messiah is going to do. He's going to bring good news to the afflicted. We're all afflicted. <laughs> he has sent us, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. We are all brokenhearted in one way or another. To proclaim liberty to the captives. We're all captives to the cycle of sin and death. Freedom to the prisoners. That's what we all are. 
and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. But then it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Well, wait a second. That sounds like what's going to happen when Jesus returns. You see, when Jesus came, he offered reconciliation with God. Peace with God. Billy Graham got it right. Jesus came to offer peace with God because we had an offense on our record. And Jesus said, like like the judge who pulls out his own wallet and pays the fine, I'll take care of that. That's what happened. And in his first coming, that's what he accomplished. But when we read about the return of Jesus, we read about him coming at the head of an army. What's the, you remember any phrases or any imagery? What happens when Jesus returns? Anyone? What's going to happen when Jesus returns? At the second coming. Let's leave the issue of the rapture out of this. At the second coming, what happens when Jesus returns? Anyone? Say it again. He's going to be king. That's right. Is there anyone opposing him? Or what happens to the people who oppose him? (laughs) That's right. They will ask for the rocks to fall on them, for the mountains to swallow them up, because they've, they've stepped out in opposition to the king, and God is going to bring judgment. This is the imagery of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the kings imagine a vain thing? The rulers of the earth have, set, have taken counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters off of us. The, 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 king, the rulers of the earth want to throw off the rule of God. And the reason that Jesus stopped in the middle of reading Isaiah chapter 61 is that this portion in Isaiah 61 is one of those prophecies that fancy theologians like to call a telescoped prophecy. Here's what that means. Um, If you look, if I look right here, if I look down the, the, the aisle, if I'm standing there and look down the aisle through a telephoto lens, and I'm looking down, the person in row four would look just like she was sitting in front of the person in row 14 because a telescoping lens compresses the distance. That's why it allows us to see into into the far distance because it brings the distant objects closer, but then it smushes them up together. A wide angle lens does the opposite. With a wide angle lens, The people in the front are exaggerated in their size. That's why you never look into a wide-angle lens because your nose will be gigantic. (laughs) I don't need any help with that. Whereas the people on the periphery, they look look like they're in Yenneveld, as we say in Yiddish. They look like they're in the middle of nowhere. But a telescoping effect, a telescoping effect is the same way as this. Let's say you're standing on a mountain ridge. I was in uh, Pennsylvania a couple years ago and we drove to the top of a ridge, and there were ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge, just someplace just west of the Poconos. And as you stood on the top of the mountaintop, it was fog. It was early morning. There was dense fog in the valleys. All we could see as we looked across was the morning sunlight starting to hit the tops of the mountains. I could see the tops of all of these ridges, one after another after another, I could not see what was in the deep valleys in between. I I was looking. There's one, there's another, there's another. There's a fire tower, there's this. All of that distance was like compressed and telescoped together. In the scripture, there are often prophecies that are telescoped together. They're brought together. We don't recognize that there are ages of time between when one thing happens and when another thing happens. Why can't we see all of this valley of time? Because we're looking at things this way. We're looking across the mountaintops. That's our only vantage point. We're not seeing things as God sees them. So in Isaiah chapter 61, it's describing the overall career of Messiah. 
Messiah comes to provide redemption, to, become, to provide the opportunity uh, for forgiveness of sin, but also part of his career, part of his ministry, is to defeat the enemies of God, to defeat those who have joined with Satan in opposing God. Well, wait a second, there's 2,000 years of separating those two events. Yeah, there is. But as far as God is concerned, it's like one thing to another to another. A thousand years is like a day. And so he doesn't see time. He's not constrained by the same constraints that we have. And so when Jesus stopped in Luke chapter 4 to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, he closes up the scroll in Luke chapter 4, and he says he drops the bombshell. He says, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He just claimed to be the Messiah. <laughs> because the passage literally says, because he has messiahed me, he has anointed me to bring good news. And he then says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. A very typically Jewish thing then happens an argument breaks out. <laughs> yes, listen to him. We always knew there was something different about Yeshua. No, he's crazy. He's not the Messiah. We know his, his, his parents. They live right here in an ordinary mud hut down the street. How could he be the Messiah? The Messiah is going to be dressed in robes. And louder and louder the argument got until finally the crowd that was against him actually tried to grab Yeshua, Jesus, and throw him off one of the hills on the city. And there's lots of hills in Nazareth. There we come to this, so th this question that we should have asked. Why did Jesus stop where he stopped? Well, the context is everything. He was reading in the synagogue. He had come to announce that he was the long-awaited Messiah. He's now opening up the opportunity for a little over three years that the people of Israel and anyone else, whosoever will, may come. The opportunity, the doors are being opened wide. This first coming was to preach good news to the downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. When he returns, it's the day of vengeance of our God. At his first coming, Grace is extended. Opportunity to join the family of God is given to men and women. Ultimately, that's going to close. Right now, we're in the age of grace. The door is still open, and people are able to enter the family of God. But there's coming a day at the return of Jesus when the doors will be slammed shut. And the calamities that are described as part of the second coming, the return of Jesus, are going to happen to the earth. That is why Jesus stopped reading where he did. His first coming was not to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. So that's where he stops reading. And that's when he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. The entire context, especially of the gospel accounts, take place within the nation of Israel among the Jewish people who were waiting for the Messiah to come. Those who were waiting for Messiah to come and were of heart for God recognized that Jesus was that Messiah. Those who were playing religion did not recognize him and they said, no, we're going to trust the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees we have the temple in Jerusalem. Nothing can happen to us. That's what they said in 30 AD. We don't need this Messiah. What happened in 70 AD? The Romans destroy the temple, not a stone left upon another stone. Just as Jesus had predicted. Context is king. When you're aware of the context of Scripture, so much more comes out. Is it important to, to look for those nuggets and to put up scripture verses on the wall? That, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. 
But understand that every one of those verses exists within a context. And they're so much richer when you explore and understand that context. Jesus was in congregational worship every Sabbath. Today, friends, we have found a permanent Sabbath rest, not in a day. Listen, there are, there are churches around the world which cannot meet on Sunday. In Israel, they can't meet on Sunday. It's Yom Rishon. It's the first day of the week. It's back to work. It's like Monday here. The most fundamental evangelical churches in Israel all meet on Saturday. It's true. All the brethren churches, strongest doctrine, they all meeting on Saturday. Why? Because our rest is no longer in a day. Our rest is in a person. We rest in the person of Messiah Jesus and the fact that we are his daughters and sons. That's our Sabbath rest today. Something to think about, and, and hopefully this will get you started on some new ways of thinking about the text. But context is king. Let's close in prayer. O oh Lord God, we praise you. We thank you for so great a salvation. O oh Lord God, we thank you that so long ago you promised to send to the world the Messiah. Promise was kept and Jesus was born. O oh Lord God, we thank you that he is all that Scripture said he would be that he is the one who has become both our judge and the one who, who pays our bail. He's gotten us out. He's brought us then into his family. Amazing love. Our Lord God, we thank you for these truths. We just simply pray that we would continue in a, in a spirit of, of seeing your hand work in all things. Our Lord God, we pray these things in the matchless name of Messiah Jesus. Amen and amen and you are dismissed.